when people walk through the doors, we want them to feel the presence of God and to be drawn to Him. They're gonna come into the church and you're gonna see the nice coffee bar, you know, get some free coffee for their first time being here. We've never felt more welcomed anywhere. Pastor and Pastor Judy were incredible. Once we started coming here, it was just kind of like, yeah, this feels good. And when you see people, they smile, and it was like people recognized me. And so that was one of the big reasons why we decided to join, is because it already felt like home and we weren't members yet. Through worship, we lift our eyes off of ourselves, and we see God speaking, and then people getting healed, and uh, you know, miracles taking place in service. I and mean, it feels like people are here for a reason and there's even translation from English to Spanish. I love that our pastor teaches from the Bible. We're not just getting his opinion. Every service here, people want her to have surgery. She didn't want to have surgery. So um, I told her every time. At the beginning of the year, Evilea started experiencing um, a lot of ear pain, uh, ear aches, and it went on for about a month until I finally took her in. And when I took her in, they found a cyst in her ear canal. We found out, you know, that she could lose her hearing if she didn't have the surgery. And I really didn't want her to have surgery. She didn't want to have surgery. So um, I told her every at the beginning of the year to have surgery. She didn't want to have surgery. So um, I told her every time there was an altar call for healing, I was like, you need to go up front. I told her that she needs to be the one to ask for healing because I wanted her to learn from this experience. So she went a couple of times, and then the last time she went, it was an encounter Sunday, and um, Jim and Lana prayed for her, and some of her friends came around and prayed. Two days later, she went to go see the specialist to get ready for surgery, and um, my husband is the one that took her, and he called me, and he was like, they said they didn't find anything, and I was like, what do you mean they didn't find anything? And I was like, go back in there and ask them what we're supposed to do because she has this growth in her ear. I was making sure that he explained everything right to the doctor. So he went back in and they're like, there's nothing there. There's nothing we, we need to do uh, unless she has pain, but she hasn't had pain and she's and there's nothing been nothing there. So we haven't had to see a doctor since then. Thinking like one of the, those weird God things. I need to give, give my life to Christ every day give it to Christ give my like my goals make it Christ like goals not living for myself that that's when I really said you know what God here I am you can have it so I've been in the program nine months the main thing was God was in that program and it really showed me how much of a future I had with Christ and how much of a future I didn't have with drugs God he, he can raise people from the dead right he can he can fix every problem you ever had. He can give you any answer you ever wanted. He can give you everything. But you need to rely on him. You know, you need to listen to him. Give it all to him. Because that life God can give you on this earth, giving it all to him, that's truly where you'll be the happiest. A year ago, I was selfish, inconsiderate, a liar, con, stealer. Now today... I know I'm a man of Christ. I have a lot of faith, and I, I have indescribable joy in my life.
bless your name. The name above every name is Jesus. The name that saved us, the name that healed us. That's the name that we're freed by. Thank you, God. You breathe new life today. And thank you that your presence is a promise because we're in Christ Jesus. Holy Spirit, we're your people. This is your house. Holy Spirit, we just ask that as we exalt the name of Jesus, as we bless him, as we honor him and worship him, that you would fill this room, that you would come face to face with us, that we could encounter you, to know you deeper, to see your glory. Guys, if that's what you want this morning, we just open your hands now. Say, Lord, I want to meet with you this morning. I want to meet with you this morning, God. Show me who you are. In Jesus' name. Are you guys ready to celebrate and exalt the Lord? Let's do it. Let's have fun this morning.
our King. I love it. I want you to know this is a house of worship. We want you to worship how you are wanting to. The altars are open. If you want to come stand, kneel, raise your hands, dance before the Lord. He is worthy of our worship. He is the only one worthy of all of our attention, all of our devotion, all of our worship. So let's posture our heart this morning as we think about the words that we're singing. And I want to read a couple verses to you really fast that talk about who our God is. So come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it and his lands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. 
Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. One of my favorite things about worship is that it changes our focus from inward to upward. As we gaze our attention on Jesus, everything else fades away. So church, let's this morning fix our focus on our King and go after and let's worship him together as a church family.
height nor depth, no demon, no angel, no fear, no nothing that can separate you from the love of Christ Jesus. The blood was enough. It was enough. It hasn't lost its power. It's still enough. Anything you need this morning, anything you're in need of, the blood is enough. It's enough. Just rest in the gratitude of what he's done. It's finished, it's finished, it's finished.
church, listen. I'm glad you're here this morning. This is an amazing crowd. But I'm not trying to be seeker friendly. I'm so hungry for more of God. I'm so hungry for the rain of God, for the outpouring of God. I told the Lord, I, I don't want to be guilty of setting my agenda and hoping you might show up. Listen, I, I was so glad this week to hear there was rain in the forecast. The cracks are so big in my yard, my dogs are about to disappear. But the cracks in our soul are even bigger. The dry ground. And I don't know about you, but I long long for God to be in the center of our midst. For God to reign and pour Himself out. To pour His Spirit out. I want to ask if you're in this place and you would say, you know what, I'm hungry for the reign of God. I'm hungry for more of God. I'm hungry for a season change, a shift. I'm hungry for that fire of God, that revival of God in my soul. I'm going to ask you right now, if we could just take some time, just set some time aside and get alone with God. Uh, I want you to get out of your seat if you'd say, I'm hungry, uh, I'm craving, uh, I'm longing uh, for the reign of God. I, I, I want to just challenge you right now, get out of your seat, come find a place. Uh, Come find a place to get alone with God. I, listen, come on. Don't worry about what anybody else is going to do, what anybody else is going to think. Don't worry about anything else. Just get out of your seat and come and let's cry out. Let's see what would happen. Come on, let's see what would happen if God would hear the cry of His people. Come on, let's see what will happen if God will hear the the cry, the desire, God more desire, God more longing, God more craving, God we desire you, God more rain, God more of your power, God more of your anointing, more of your spirit, pour out God, pour out God, come on church, Come on, church. Come on, church. Cry out to him today.
with every head bowed and every eye closed, I ask them to bring the house lights up just a little bit for me. If you don't know Jesus this morning, there's that hunger and that craving that's awakened in your heart. This is your moment. Listen, I know what it is to try and try and try again to change myself, to fix myself. And it's hopeless without Jesus. It can't be done. But I know the moment that I surrendered to Jesus, He gave me a new heart, a new desire, a new love, a new hope. And today, never known Jesus or possibly you used to walk with him but for some reason you walked away he didn't walk away from you but for some reason there's that separation today he's inviting you to come home today his heart is longing for you to come home no one looking around. Listen, the truth of the matter is, is you have to know that you're a sinner and you need a Savior and you can't do it by yourself. None of us can or we wouldn't have needed a Savior, but God knew we couldn't. So today, if you're in the house and you'd say, preacher, that's me. I need Jesus today. I need to make him Lord of my life today. I want to surrender my life. Listen, this isn't a whitewashing. This isn't, a, uh, this isn't just a little prayer and, and you go on your way and you add God to your life. No, this is a life change. This is huge. This is the biggest thing you'll ever do on planet Earth. But you'll have a new hope for eternity, for all of eternity. If that's you in the house today, with every head bowed, every eye closed, right where you are, if you'd say, Preacher, I need Jesus this morning. Would you just slip it up and write back down? I just want to pray a simple prayer over you this morning. Yes, God bless you. Thank you, sis. Is there another this morning? Just slip it up. Write back down quickly this morning. Don't wait. Quickly. Don't wait this morning. I want to pray that simple prayer with you this morning. If you're watching online, I want to challenge you. Say the prayer with us this morning. Said if we had believe in our heart, we'd confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, we would be saved. Church, would you just help me say this simple prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, we come in Jesus' name. We believe that Jesus is your son and that you sent him to earth to save mankind. We are sinners and we need a Savior. He took our place. We deserve to die. We deserve punishment because we had sinned. But He who knew no sin took my place. And today I'm forgiven. Today I'm right with you. Today I'm friends with you. I'm not at war with you. But I'm accepted. And my name is being written down in heaven. And I'm your child. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, would you give it up for Jesus this morning? Man. Man, you guys are so much fun to worship with. Good night. How I miss worshiping with y'all. Uh, listen, we're going we're gonna to transition here this morning, and we're going to do our give and greet. And, and listen, I've been praying over finances, and I believe God has given me a, rev a revelation that I, I, I don't know how long how many months it's going to take me to share this with you but but here's 
How, how many's heard of the widow and the, the mite? The, the widow's mite, right? And so what we find in Mark and in Luke is the story that Jesus is in the temple and he sits down opposing the offering box, the place where people would come and bring their gifts. And he's sitting there and he's watching and the wealthy are coming and dropping in large amounts. And then a widow comes by and drops in two mites, which equals about a penny. And it gets Jesus' attention and he goes, whoa, guys, come over here. Look at this. This widow, all of them gave out of their abundance. This widow gave out of her lack all that she had to live on. There's so much in that passage of scripture, so much that I'm going to back all the way up and I'm going to start with this. There was a treasury in the house of God. Come on. All the way back to the first thing that we see, there, why was there a treasury in the house of God? Malachi tells us, bring you all the tithe into the storehouse, that there might be meat in my house. God has always had a plan to partner with his people to perpetuate his kingdom. Oh, come on. That's just good stuff. God has always had a plan to perpetuate his kingdom and his plan was to partner with us. Oh, it gets better, but I'm not going there this week. Why was and is there a treasury in the house of God? Watch, to take care of God's business. God's in the business of souls. The church ought to be in the business of souls and discipling and sending missionaries around the world and helping the needy. And that's God's business. And we need to be in God's business. Amen. If you ever wonder, why does the church talk about money? Well, you just heard it. Why is there a treasury in the house of God? Now listen, we're going to move into our give and greet time. There are four stations around the building that you can give live. There are lots of ways that you can give on the screen, Zelle, the church app, so many, so many different ways. But right now, I want you to get up out of your seat, and I want you to go over and meet people that you go introduce yourself to someone that you don't know. Go! a quarter where we turn aside from our normal routine to encounter God in a special way. 
Each Encounter Sunday will have just one 11 a.m. service so that the entire church body can press into the presence of God together. You won't want to miss this time of extended worship or the opportunity to build community at the All Church Potluck following the service. Let's meet together for one service and encounter God. Are you new to the family? Or maybe today is your first time joining us. Then you're for sure to have questions and curiosities about what it means to be a part of the family here at Mustang Creek. Bring your entire family to party with pastors. A fun lunch for new guests to connect with our pastors and leaders. You'll hear a little about the history and vision of the church and what next steps you can take to get connected in communities. As always, you can find events, registration, and sermons on the website and information station in the lobby. So it's easy to get connected. Now it's time to lean in and receive the fresh thing that God is saying to us today. Don't know where all of you came from, but it sure is good to see you today. Wow! Look at this crowd, man! How awesome is that? Uh, listen, we've been away on vacation. Can you see the tan? You know, uh, uh, soaking up some sun. And uh, so thank you for allowing us to get away. And I want to say thank you to the staff. Uh, you know, I, I've said it a million times that uh, the sign of a healthy church is that the lead pastors can go away and, and um, we're not even missed, that, that things just keep going uh, without us even here. So I'm so grateful for all of the staff that did such a great job while we were away. Um, listen, I, I do want to say that if this is your first time at Mustang Creek, would you take a moment and take the card out of the seat behind, uh, in front of you, the pocket of the seat in front of you, and fill it out, or you can shoot the QR code and fill one out online. But if you will do that, we have a, a, a great gift for you as you leave the house this morning and uh, there's also a, a free trip to our coffee bar, man. Our coffee bar is killing it. And uh, so if you, would, if you would just take a moment and fill that out, we would love to have that. And if you're watching online for the first time, we are so glad that you are here with us. And we'd love to see you in person really, really soon. Well, listen. We have, uh, we have been talking, Pastor Judy started the conversation a few weeks ago, and today we're going to tag team, is that all right? We're going to tag team preach today, and uh, uh, last time she preached, or every time she preaches, I have people come up to me and say, dude, you better watch out, she's going to take your job. Well, she, <laughs> she is, uh, uh, she is my, my sweetheart, she's my... Uh, I, I, man, I, I, she's milking it for all it worth. Uh, 42 years of marriage. I know we don't look that old, but she's my girlfriend. And, and I tell you, I, I love doing life with this lady. Listen, we've been having a conversation about small groups and the value of small groups. And before you turn us off today, I, I want you to really check your heart and say, God, if there's something to this, I want to hear it. If there's something to it, reveal it to me today. Would you stand with me real quick? We're going to read the word and honor the word, and then we'll pray and get started. Something amazing to me is that God knows us better than we know ourselves. And what we've been talking about is the importance and the value of living life in community. Our church is called Mustang Creek community Man. church. We love to tell people that we do life together because that's what God advised us to do, especially as time is getting more difficult and days are getting harder. But something I want us to look at today is we're going to notice the setup here for the book of Acts chapter 2. Now, automatically, when I say Acts chapter 2, everyone thinks they know what we're going to talk about. You don't know, trust me. But what happened in the book of Acts chapter 2 is very well known. We know that the Holy Spirit began to fall on God's people, and things were amazing and shocking and really fast, that the 
people were talking in different languages and other people were drawn trying to figure out what is going on there. And then Peter stands up in the midst of this big crowd and he begins to tell them what's happening, that the, the whole story of Jesus and why Jesus came and what's happening. And then immediately after that, as soon as we see 3,000 people were added to the church. If today 3,000 people were added to our church, would you give them your seat? You see, what we have to do is begin to see that when we begin to act like the church in the Bible, we're going to see the results that the church in the Bible saw. Yeah. If I say, okay, don't panic over 3,000, what about just 300 would you stay after this service and help us set up for the next service? And would you serve that 300 people in the next service? Do you see God's plan is so perfect that he lays it out and gives us an example. And I'm going to be reading from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 42 through 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now, that's just real fast. Teaching and fellowship. Fellowship is in the Bible. It's okay for us to hang out. Teaching is valuable. We all need to be taught. Keep going. The next thing was the breaking of bread. How many of you can get into that? Bread is my favorite sin. Whew. I can break some bread now. I love some bread. She will not bread. do a meal without bread, That's right. And you got to put some butter on it because that makes it even better. Jelly if you got it. I better stop talking. I'm getting hungry. And prayer. They prayed together. They ate together. They hung out together. They taught each other. Keep going. And awe came upon every soul. Have you ever had awe just come upon your soul? Or you're just like, wow. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. I told the first service, that sounds like a good garage sale to me. <laughs> and day by day, attending the temple together, they went to church together. Together they broke bread in their homes and received food. And with glad and generous hearts, they praised God. And having favor with all the people... And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Can we pray real quick? Mm -hmm. Father, I thank you right now that we have the opportunity to stand here together as a community together and look into your word as it applies to us. I'm just asking you that every heart would receive truth deep inside us, so deep that it transforms our thinking about your plan for your church, God. I just ask that you would do that now under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We give you thanks. Amen. Amen. Okay, you can be seated. Really quick, I'm going to sum up a few things for you, just utilizing the scripture. Then I'm going to tag pastor in, and I'm not responsible for what he does. <laughs> The first church model is laid out there in the book of Acts chapter 2, but it's also ongoing as a theme all through the Word. Uh, the first church model shows us that the important thing was that they had devotion to teaching, that they knew they needed to know more. Sometimes we just have to find ourselves at a place where we can say, you know what, I don't know it all. I need to know more. They devoted themselves to fellowship and hanging out and spending time with people. And I think that's funny because there used to be a time when you could not get the people to leave. They just kept hanging out and fellowshipping after church. And now it's funny, everybody's in a hurry. I have somewhere else I need to be. They broke bread together. They prayed together. They shared their resources, and they helped to meet each other's needs. Hebrews chapter 10, I'm going to read you just a little bit more showing you and proving that it's precept upon precept in the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, 
Oh, I'm sorry, I used the word for my benefit there, didn't I? But encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. He's, in, he's telling us that we need to be busy about encouraging one another, spurring each other on to love and good deeds, not neglecting meeting together. And there's one more scripture I want to stack on top of that. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Bear ye one another's burdens, and you will fulfill God's law. Bearing someone else's burdens is sometimes difficult because a lot of us have forgot what it is like to have someone support you and care for you and hold you up. And praying for and helping each other in times of need is very important. I mentioned before, it's not just posting a little meme of praying hands, but it's literally appointing myself to pray for that person. It's God waking you up in the night with that person on your mind and you getting out of the bed and calling their name out and really covering them in prayer. Tag pass. So community is biblical. Would you agree with that? Everything she just said... Straight out of the Bible, it's biblical. Listen, as we were, as we were preparing uh, for this time together today, uh, the scripture that so gripped my heart, it, it's kind of become a cliche uh, to, to the church world, but you'll remember it out of Ecclesiastes. It says a threefold cord's not easily broken, right? And everybody knows that part, but let me back up just a couple of verses and read this to you. It says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. Here's the part I want you to get. But woe, everybody say woe. woe. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Woe to him that is alone. Guys, listen. I, I sat at the table with a, a pretty good sized group of lead pastors from around Forney this week. And we were having conversation and I, I said this to them. I said, you know, listen, I, I've pastored in an, another place before. We are unlike almost any other city. We are unlike the average city. This area is unlike the average area. In most cities, in most towns, they are the same people that have lived there for many, many years. There's not many moving out. There's not many moving in. But there's nothing really happening there. There are the same 10, 15, 20 churches that have been there for the last 50 years. And everybody has visited every church. Come on now. You know, so they already know what's going on at everybody else's church. And they've already picked the church that suits them the best. Forney is not like that. This community is not like that. This county is not like that. This there are people moving in in droves, coming from all over the world. Moving in to the Metroplex and moving in to Kaufman County. Did you know that Forney grew last year after attrition grew by 2,500 people? Every household in Forney, not every, the average household in Forney is like 2.9. Add that up and see how many houses you come up with. And try to understand why there are so many structures going up everywhere we drive. Why the roads are jam-packed everywhere we drive. Understand that Kaufman County, this region, this region is expected by 2027 to have 177,000 people in our region. In Forney ISD, I sat across the table 
from Dr. Terry this week. In 40 ISD in 2019 had 11,000 students in our schools. This year, are you ready for this? This year, 40 ISD has 17,702 students. I'm trying to let that sink in. People are moving in to our community by droves. Now, wait, wait. I need you to visualize this. <clears throat> if you have moved here in the last couple of years from another state, would you please stand to your feet? Come on, participate with me. <clears throat> Whoa! Oh my, oh my gosh! I didn't expect that. If you have moved here from another country, would you stand to you? No, 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 no. Stand up, people. Stand up. If you've moved here from another country, stand to your feet. If you have no blood family within a 20-mile radius, stand to your feet. Are you stinking kidding me? People are moving here every day. They have no family, they have no community, they have no support system, and community is biblical. You can be seated. But woe is to him that is alone. And the church, listen, we're all kinfolk and we're not from Arkansas. <laughs> we have one father. That means we all kin. One body. One family. One God and father, right? One Lord. That means we've got one boss. One faith. We all are striving in the same direction. The church should be the place that we find community and that they find community. A lot of things happen in community. Something that I find interesting is that we miss out on a lot of opportunities if we're not fully aware of what is available to us. Pastor, would you hand me my toys over there so I can uh, use them as an yes, example? I'll be careful with them. Uh, something that I've learned is that if I am in community with other people, I have to be willing to give them permission to sharpen me. Now, there's a portion of Scripture everyone's familiar with, Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. But early this morning, I got up, and I went into the kitchen, and for some reason, the Lord just made this so clear to me, I had to pull it out and share it with you. Now, go ahead and hand me this safe piece of uh, example. I don't know if you can see this, but this is a knife. I'm not going to use it on anyone or hurt anyone, but I want to show you the picture of what sharpening looks like. For many years, and I'm not making this up many years, I did not realize how important it is to sharpen your knife. Especially if you're going to be like slicing things up and, and cooking, because a sharp knife that won't slice through a tomato is what I grew up with. This knife would probably do that for me, but what I have to realize is that I have to sharpen it. Now hold the mic for me. Yes, Thank yeah. you. I promise not to cut you. If I take this knife and I want to sharpen it, I have this little, what do you call that gadget? Whetstone. Whetstone in my kitchen drawer. I pull it out and, sh 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 and I can sharpen my knife. But I couldn't find that once, so I had to grab another knife. And I took the other knife and I did this and I sharpened them together. 
Now, really quick, cooperate with me. Look at the neighbor on your left and say to them, you sharpen me. <laughs> and look at the person on the right and say, you sharpen me. They will only sharpen you if you give them permission to sharpen you. And you need to surround yourself with people who are sharp <laughs> so they can sharpen you. So if I challenge you and say, of the closest five people around you, are you being sharpened? Is there anyone in your inner circle who is willing to tell you you're wrong? Is there anyone who is willing to say, I'm concerned, I'm sensing something in your spirit. I'm concerned about that attitude. Or you're at the store, you're spending way too much money right now. <laughs> There's a reason I choose to shop alone. <laughs> but here's what we would prefer to do. Rather than have someone sharp sharpening us, we prefer to surround ourselves with a warm towel. I would rather have warm towels that when I'm hurting because I got an attitude problem, they just cover me up. They just tell me, it's okay, you deserve to be upset. You deserve that attitude. That is not what we're looking for in the body of Christ. The first church had people who met together who were concerned about each other and who could be very real with each other. They sharpened each other. That happens in community. It's interesting to me, though, the challenge that we have is that we sharpen each other in every way, in our relationships. I need someone around me who's been a really good wife so they can sharpen my wife's skills. I'm not going to go to someone who can't cook and ask them to teach me to cook. I'm not going to a poor person and ask them to show me how to be profitable. I want to surround myself with people who can sharpen me. I want to grow in my faith and my knowledge of God. So I want to surround myself with people who are full of faith and the knowledge of God. Pastor. Amen. <clears throat> so today, to reiterate, we're talking about the value of community. We're talking about the biblical need for community. I, I want you to understand, I, you're going to hear this from me over and over again. If you know me very well, you've already heard it from me. I don't want to be a, another church that does small groups. Let that sink in. I want to be a church of small groups. Let me, let, me, let me say that again. I don't want to be a church that does small groups. I want to be a church of small groups. There's a difference in those two things. Listen, I, I, I want to be found, you've heard me say this a million times if you know me very well, I want to be found doing what matters to God. When he gets back, I don't want to be the church that's coddling the saints. Pacifying and building consumer saints. Boy, that's good. I don't want to be the guy that is coddling the saints and building consumer saints. See, I want to do... What matters to Jesus? And I've said it over and over again. What matters to Jesus is winning the lost, discipling the found, and equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry. That's what I want to be found doing. And the fact of the matter is, is that the church has trended down, 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 that uh, the percentage of people that attends church today and used to attend church is 50% less than it was 20 years ago. Come on. 
And the truth of the matter is, is that we meet less and less. Back when I grew up, we went to church on Sunday morning. We went to church on Sunday night. We went to church on Wednesday and sometimes on Friday and Saturday. Up and when we went to snow. church, we went to church for three, yeah. four, five hours. Yeah. Yep. And it is such an imposition today to ask people to go to church once a week for an hour and a half let alone go to a small group. But see, here's the deal. A small group is not just another activity. It's a building of a community that has purpose. See, if I want to win the lost, small groups are evangelistic. If I want to disciple the found, how many could upgrade your vehicle right now? You could use an upgrade on your vehicle. Come on now. One, two, three. Yeah, yeah. Come on, come on, come on. Right? Listen, the church went from multiple services a week to one service a week. And we, our delivery mechanism for discipleship needs to be upgraded. Small groups and community groups are the delivery mechanism for discipleship in the body of Christ. Mm. I, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop right there. There are benefits to being a part of a small group. When I think about small groups, now we, we are, you know, obviously we already have very, very diverse interest groups, things that we hang out together and do things together because we love each other. But today we're really focusing on a community group. And a community group is someplace where I am going to be there because those are my people. Now sometimes your people don't look like what you think your people look like. But the benefit that comes from being a part of a small group is that you will be discipled as you are discipling. So you are doing what Christ mandated for us to do. We're supposed to be good stewards of the Word, and we're supposed to understand the Word. But I have found it so interesting that there are so many people who are coming into the church today that did not grow up like Pastor did in the church all the time going to church. And there's so much that they don't know that they want to know and things they need to know that they don't know they need to know but in a small group they can go what the bible says what man that is the most amazing conversation to have with someone when you're saying you know the word says we're supposed to blah 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 and then they go what and then you can open the word and you can disciple and there'll be someone there who will add to what you're saying and you grow from what they said so now you have an environment of spiritual growth, and that's important. But we also have an opportunity, now that that's happening, to, to dig into the Word, to study it, and to have huge discussions about it. Now, Pastor, when we, we first got married, I had a real problem because I would walk in and see him at the dinner table with his mom, and she'd have her Bible open, and he would have his Bible open, and I couldn't figure out what was happening right there because they looked like they were arguing. <laughs> Because they both believed they both were right. And you know what? They were both right. But it was so brilliant to me to see them actually iron, sharpening iron. Because discussing the word brings understanding. Pastor. I love that word, discussion. Um, I, I don't know about if, if there are other people in the building that are like me, but I process things sometimes when they're coming out of my mouth. Yes. <laughs> sometimes sometimes he should late. bring them back in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I've even had Pastor Judy look at me and say, you know, sometimes I just need to, to uh, talk. Just I don't need an answer. I just need to talk because I'm processing while I talk. 
we learn more when we slow down. See, the, it's great when we set in a in a when we have a setting like this and, and there's a teaching like this and, and we hear a sermon or a teaching or whatever and we receive information. But when we slow things down and we begin to discuss and process, there's a greater understanding that happens. And isn't it sad when our perspective is the only perspective we have? You can say that again. Mm. It's dangerous, too, because it could be the wrong perspective. Amen. You know the reason we like to preach together? Because you get a man's perspective and a woman's perspective. Come on. And there's something about setting down and slowing down and being able to have conversation with other people around you about the Word of God and build community. Now... One of the words that comes up when we talk about it is accountability. See, it's, it's one thing for us all to attend church together and go, Yeehaw, Pastor, that's wonderful, love that, and deuces, see you next week. <laughs> Come on, isn't that what we've done in this culture today? I like what you're saying. I know I should, but, you know. Right? That's kind of the way it is today. But the truth of the matter is, is that we need accountability in the body of Christ. We're huge in our men's group. Man, let me tell you, I, I had tears in my eyes on Wednesday night. Uh, we have table talk discussion in our, in our men's group. And there are three men's classes happening right there in that little bitty um, uh, three classrooms there. We've even made our foyer a classroom. And, and uh, so while they were having table talk, I'm walking around to each classroom looking in and I'm seeing in this one classroom there's, there's three young men less than 21 years old in a men's class. And, and I looked around my class and I found the oldest guy in there and I said, how old are you? And, and Chris, he told me, he said, 80 years old. Come on. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? From 20 to 80 years old, iron sharpening iron. Yes. Wow! Yes. But accountability requires that I give somebody permission, come on, mm -hmm. to speak into my life. I have to give them permission and watch. There has to be a space that we can spend enough time together to build trust. Because if I don't trust you, I ain't giving you permission, baby. You hearing what I'm saying? If I don't trust, because see, here's what Proverbs says. Proverbs says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Community means something. And then the scripture says this, and, and I'm going I'm to get in trouble. I don't care. Uh, accountability and encouragement. The Bible in our text said that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. That we are to provoke one another unto good word to encourage one another into that perfection, into that iron sharpening iron. We're to be challenging one another unto good works. And the truth of the matter is, is he goes on to say, and much more so as you see the day approaching. You know, COVID taught us a lot of lessons. COVID taught us that the government has the power to take away our right to assembly. Did you know that all around the world there are underground churches? Because it is not legal to meet. Y'all are thinking, oh, that 
you guys, we live in America. We was born in America. That ain't coming to you. You are crazy if you think that way. The spirit of Antichrist is already here. And uh, listen, uh, has anybody ever seen the fish, the little Christian fish? You probably need to remove it from your car if you have a problem with road rage. I'm working on mine. I'm working on my road rage. Uh, but, but listen, do you know where the fish came from? The, in, the, in the early church, the first three generations of persecution in the church, if you were talking to someone and you were a Christian, you'd just reach down with your foot and you'd, draw, you'd, you'd just kind of draw a little circle like that, a little half circle. If they were a Christian and they were standing opposing you, they would reach with their foot and they would draw the other half of the fish. That would let you know. That would let you know that they're a believer. Because there was danger of them being persecuted and beheaded for the cause of Christ and for their faith. Listen, guys. I, there are underground churches happening all around the world. Do you know what they are? Small groups. That's true. Right? We need to learn this American way of doing church. We can do better. We can upgrade the vehicle. I'm going to quit. Go ahead. Some things that are really interesting that can happen in a small group. One that I really want to focus on is authenticity. You actually are given the freedom to just be who you are. It's so funny to me. I lead a group of pastor's wives, and we have a small group, and we meet, and we, iron sharpening iron, have conversations. Now, our first couple of meetings, it was really more surface-level conversation of, you know, we... we we don't discuss the church or the size of the church or anything like that, but just kind of what we're dealing with or what's happening. Yeah, my kids just pray, you know, they find a husband and pray, you know, not just me, but just everything, all right? I don't want to get in trouble. But one of the things I noticed was about the third or fourth time that we met, authenticity began to happen. And we began to hear more often than not, can I be honest? Let me be real. Because I'm not always honest and real until, like Pastor said, I trust you. And I don't trust you unless I have spent time with you. Not when you're on good behavior in a huge crowd, but when you're just being authentic to who you are in a small group. I give you permission to just be real. And you would be shocked at some of the things that we're comfortable saying. But we also have the ability to turn around and say, I love you enough to tell you that's probably not a good attitude. Can we pray with you about that? That kind of authenticity and real, real things, that happens in a group. Pastor mentioned a moment ago that the wounds of a friend are sweet. They're good for us. I have a few friends who can wound me enough that I change. A few. There are a few people in my life that can look into my eyes and say, Judy, you really need to work on that. I, I, don't, I don't think that's very beautiful or something that sh you should be known for. You need to work on that. I have people close to me that can say that, and though it hurts my heart that I've disappointed them, I want to change. But that didn't happen by me waving at them across the church on Sunday. That happened by me spending quality time just being real. So a lot of times that will happen in a small group. You don't just build relationships. You build meaningful connections. The connections where you say, I'm your ride or die. I got your back. I'm here for you. Those are the ones who are not just saying it, but they're really doing that. Practical care and support. When I need help, I can call somebody. Listen, I, my car's broke down. I can't find my husband. Would you come get me? Prayer and support for one another. Outreach and evangelism. The ability to invite my friends to come hang out with my friends. I can invite people that don't even know God. They won't come to church, but they may come to my house or to my friend's house. I can even say, you should see these people's house. It is so beautiful. Yeah. 
And they'll come just to see the house, but then they start making connection. And then they want to know more about the God who has bonded our hearts together. So here's, here's what I want to tell you today as we wrap this up. And we have a call to action. What are we looking for? Interest groups are great. I love interest groups. I love interest groups. And if you're interested in starting an interest group, let us know. You can shoot the QR code and, uh, and send us your ideas, and, and that, would be, that would be amazing. What we really, really, really want to focus on is we want to focus on community groups that build that community, that trust, and challenge one another. These, there's interest groups and then there's community groups. But we're looking for some leaders that say, you know what? Listen, I see the value in this and I want to be a part of being a biblical church. Pastor Judy, tell us what a community group looks like. A community group meets once or twice a month. They meet in someone's home. They usually, 99.9999% of the time, require or include some kind of food because we like to eat together and break bread. They have fun and fellowship. They laugh with each other and they talk with each other. They have a devotion of some type. They may discuss maybe the message that was preached on Sunday or something maybe the Lord's really speaking to the leader. But they have time together where they talk about the Word of God. And then they share needs and they pray with each other. It's not real complicated to host one of those things in your home. You only need three options. A lot of times we say, well, I want to be involved, but I, I'm not, I don't have a very nice house, so I don't want to invite someone to my house. It's okay. If you would like to be a leader, all we ask is that you go through training with us and you're ready to actually take on the leadership role of caring and overseeing a few groups of people. But if you don't have a home that you're comfortable inviting people to, we have a lot of people who are in the second group who say, I want to be a part of the body. I want to have a community in my home because God has blessed me with such a beautiful home. But I don't want to lead a group. I don't feel qualified or I'm not, I'm not sure I can commit to leading a group, but I will host it in my home. So now we have a leader who doesn't have a home or has a home but is not ready to open it up. Or we have a home but no leader. So now what we need is leaders. We need someone who says, I'll use my home and I'll lead. Or someone who says, I'll lead in someone else's home. Or someone who says, I'm not, I'm not committing to leading but I'm opening my home. Because what happens there is we can find opportunity to connect people in homes all over our county that's growing so fast. And we can assure that they have a really nice place to meet and eat and share and grow and sharpen each other. The, they're going to put this screen, the square, the little QR code. QR code. Shoot that and let us know of one of those three, which would you be interested in participating in? Because we're looking for people who want to be a part of what God is doing right here at Mustang Creek Community Church. How many would say, you know what, Pastor, over the past year or two, I've had some of the biggest challenges of my life or I've been through some of the darkest times of my life. I mean, to just be honest and say, look at that. Look, look. Oh, my gosh. Wouldn't it have been great if you would have had a tight-knit family, community to go through that season with and be real with? Listen. If you're single, you don't have to be alone. Maybe you just got married and everything's changed. You don't have to be alone. Maybe you just moved here. You don't have to be alone. Maybe you don't have 
blood family that lives in the immediate area. You don't have to be alone. Maybe you're recently widowed. You don't have to be alone. Two things. One, you may be sitting there and you may be going, Oh, I got all that stuff. I, I got community. I got family. I got, I got friends. I got... Then it is incumbent upon us to whom has much. He requires much in return. Right? The other thing is, as Pastor Judy said a few weeks ago, if you are in need of that... So, what you have need of and watch what God does. Today I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet with me. Some of you are in a lonely place. And today, I'm just going to pray over you. Some of you are in a great place. I'm going to pray over you too. I'm going to pray that God awakens an understanding and a desire to help others. Father, today, those that are lonely, Those that have felt like they're all alone. They're doing life alone. Lord, surround them right now. Heal their hearts right now. God, bring connection and community right now. Father, bring that family of Christ that body of Christ together. Father, for those of us that have, let something awaken in our heart that we realize, that we realize what we've been blessed with. And Lord, we surrender that to you. God, I'm asking you today, that you would help us to be a church of small groups. Not a church that does small groups. A church that does life together, not just a church that talks about doing life together. I thank you for it today, God. Thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Now, church, today, as... Pastor Brian is coming. I'm I'm challenging you today. If the Lord is pricking your heart and you want to be a leader or host, I'm asking you to shoot that QR code before you walk out of this building and fill out just a four or five questions. Answer four or five questions. Before you leave this building today, By faith, I'm speaking this by faith. By faith, we'd like to, by October, the first week of October, begin some new small groups. We'll do some training. We'll build a team. But I'm asking you, hear the voice of the Lord. Let's do this thing right. Let's build community. Let's reach the hurting. Let's have a family that does life together. Thank you, Pastor Brock. Amen. Man, what a important, yeah. Let's give it up for the Lord. Listen, we want to not just be hearers of the word, right? But we want to be doers. And so we need to take what we heard today. We need to digest it. And we need to see how we fit within that context and what God's asking us to do. You know, God created us. When he created us, he created us for community. I mean, that was, he created us with that desire and that need. 
I do want to just say, if you tried, if the Lord already spoke to you and you tried to shoot that QR code a little while ago, it was not working. So we're going to put that back up there. It's up there right now. You can shoot that again, and it is working now. Okay, so that wasn't a sign from the Lord that you weren't supposed to do it. Okay, that just meant he was testing you to see if you were really committed. So I don't know. Yes, I think they're all. I think they're all working now. We ch- we did try them, so at least this this one should be working. If you can't stop at the information center, listen, we are gonna end up closing service right now. But if you are staying for open ha- or for party with the pastors today, uh, we will just have you. If you have kids, go get your children and then recheck them back in uh, at the kids ministry check-in station. Uh, You want to recheck them back in. We'll make sure they get food back there and then find a table over here. Uh, We're just trying to save two spots at each table for staff members because we want to get to know you. That's what this whole thing is about. Uh, But please join us if it's your first time here today and you don't have lunch plans. Just stay with us if it's your first time. Uh, Guys, we love you. We enjoy doing life with you, and we look forward to what God is going to do in this house with the community groups. Guys, God bless you.